let's get started. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming and thanks to our panels for showing up. We have Don, Rich, Bob, and Bob. And uh, they're um, basically, they know more about launching and landing than, than um, I'll ever know. And <laughs> they've probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. But I also wanted to put a plug in for um, the, the thermal duration flying we're doing down at Hollister Field. So on Thursdays in the morning and on Sundays in the morning, uh, a group of us go out there, we set up our, our um, winches and we pull up planes and, and we practice our launches and our landings. We, we set out a landing tape so everyone can practice. And we're also open to other people coming, uh, even non-club members of their AMA, certainly have an AMA insurance card. And then on the last Sunday of the month, we do a, a contest. So that's another thing people can come to. It's a uh, uh, Bob. <laughs> another Bob takes care of the contest. Uh, so anyway, so we're, we're, we use it as one of our great fields, and, and we really appreciate all the support we've gotten. And we really appreciate the, the mentors that have helped all of us fly. So why don't we take it away? I'm going to help monitor it, uh, moderate it a bit. but. Um, why don't we just take first yeah, question? The latest yeah. version. You have it. Yep. So, who wants to handle the aircraft types and talk about that? Mm -hmm. Start here. Well, basically, there are uh, several air aircraft types, one being, of course, full house um, flaps, ailerons, uh, rudder, elevator. Um, Sometimes spoilers, but not usually. And uh, then the other typical is, is res, rudder, elevator, spoiler only. Um, occasionally, someone will have a bent wing, which will be the same as a res, but they'll have flaps. That's, I've only seen that a couple of times. People don't usually do that. And uh, of course, res is, is my favorite. Um, it's simple, but uh, you don't, you're not allowed the, uh, or afforded the ability to have a variable uh, camber in the wing and uh, uh, different kinds of, of flight modes. Uh, but then again, that's, that's a challenge of it. Uh, they all launch pretty much the same way? Well, not really. Um, they do and they don't. I mean, Full house, usually people set up some small amount of, uh, of camber in the wing to optimize the, uh, the launch and then take that camber out, uh, I believe, right as the zoom curves right at the top. In the case of res, at least the way I do it, I set everything up so that everything is, is the way it's supposed to be, uh, dive test and balance and, and uh, Flying straight and level, and you know everything is, is set up, and then at the very end, set the tow hook where it has to be for optimum uh, launch. And then it's to me, it's just hands off, except for the occasional rudder, um, and then the zoom, of course, at the end. So Bob, do you want to talk about different ways of launching? Yeah, um, there's essentially four ways to launch, and depends on what aircraft you're flying, but. Uh, high start is what most everybody gets started on. It's probably the it's probably the safest in a lot of ways because it's not as violent as the other well, ways. Yes. Other than <laughs> other than uh, catapult uh, DLG. With one so, exception, I, I lost I lost a plane on high start uh, once with a slick fuselage and a very heavy high start. That's a bad combination. I, <laughs> I too my introduction to. Uh, uh, Soaring was watching some guys fly at Santa Teresa Park, and I watched a guy throw his airplane, and he got drug about a hundred feet. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and he carried it back in his pocket. So that was an interesting, but it's safe from the standpoint of bodily injury and such. So I'm trying to make it so you don't have to know the terminology. So high start. High start's a bungee, or it's a, actually a surgical tubing that's anchored at one end. You stretch it hook it to the tow hook and give it a heave and it'll, it, it self-regulates uh, to a large degree how fast it flies, the climb rate and such. Typical high star will have 100 feet of surgical tubing and about three or 400 feet of line and then the parachute. Okay. The parachute helps the hook come off when 
when the energy is expended out of the and then blow hopefully blow back to you when it yes. comes off. But you do have to you stretch have to it back to where your launch area is. So there's a there's a little work involved in that. Uh, with the winch, we have uh, a retriever. Not everybody has a retriever, but we've been lucky enough with all of our four or five uh, winches have retrievers for them, and that returns the line to you, so you don't have to go walk for it. Uh, arrow tow is a pretty simple concept. You tow it up by another airplane. You both have a tow of rele a, a release mechanism, so you can bail, and the tow plane tows you up to altitude, and you release it. At will. Those are servo control line. And, it, and everything servo control, including the release. Um, the, other, the other system is a DLG. You can also use a rubber band launch. Those are small aircraft typically. One, uh, one thing I'd like to add is that, that for, for people that are new to the sport, um, it's sometimes it, it's a little fearful to get onto a winch after you've been flying on a high start for a long time. It seems like you're going into a lot of power. But the one thing that you have to remember is that with a high start, if there is an issue when the rubber is contracted, you cannot stop it. <laughs> with a winch, at least you can take your foot off uh, if you remember to do so. Uh, but with a high start, when things go terribly wrong, they just keep going. <laughs> well, the next topic we have kind of listed too is safety, and that reflects on the winch more than anything else because the winch is a it's a, it's a violent process. It's a it's kind of a dangerous thing if you're if you're not careful. Not only is it dangerous to the airplane, if you have a lightly loaded airplane, you could you could easily collapse the wings um, and destroy your aircraft. Uh, but also the the uh, retriever is a source of uh, danger too because if you're not there's several ways you can get hurt with the retriever. One is if the retrieve if the wind's blowing. The, as the plane goes up, especially if, they, if they're tapping it up, tapping is a process to change the speed of the climb rate and yeah, reduce change. the load on the wings. Uh, but when the wind's blowing, and I've, we've kind of got some arbitrary numbers, most of the bent wing airplanes, I, in my belief, and you guys have flown more of them than I have, is about eight miles an hour. After about eight, the loads get pretty high. Um, and it's with rudder only, it's a little difficult to control sometimes. But even if, after 10 to 12, it gets a little bit ugly with a winch, with a, a molded airplane. Um, and uh, I did come up with an idea here a few weeks ago. I haven't shared it with everybody yet. But if we do have high winds and people want to fly, the danger to people in the launch area, including the retriever guy, is that the line blows back and you can get it caught around people and planes and everything else. So if you want to fly at the higher speed, just take the retriever off and you'll have to walk the line back. But that's not that's a doable thing, at least you can still fly. And it, and it makes it pretty safe. Um, the, the, so there's, what, so what can happen to, to is, uh, the, how you can get in trouble with is the, um, the airplane can pop off at a fairly low altitude. Uh, pop off is just what it sounds like. It comes off of the tow hook, uh, which can be caused by a bad setup, a bad CG, uh, a bad tow hook position, a defective tow hook. There's some probably some other things that can happen. Yeah, sometimes tow hooks, at least in my case, for example, I have tow hooks mounted with, they're, they're threaded and they're held on with nuts. And sometimes a nut can work loose, the tow hook can spin, and you can wind up popping off. So and that's something you have to be careful, be aware of, and check it periodically. Maybe Don, do you have any, any comments on safety or things you've seen that cause problems? And, you know, the main thing I've seen is people like me knocking the tail off. <laughs> you mean hit your hat or your head? Hit your hat, your head. I mean whole tail of the airplane. Yeah. yeah, well, I've done the head thing, too. I didn't realize I had a shoulder problem. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, actually, there's a, a cool story. I, I knocked a tail off an airplane completely when I was learning to launch at Davis Contest. And uh, the day before, I read what to do when that happens. You fly it inverted and use flaps as elevator. Mm -hmm. And it landed beautifully. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of weird. Uh, uh, as I was doing it, two guys shouted, roll it inverted, and said, got it, you know, but um, the main problem I had in learning was 
not diving so deep and getting, you know, every, if you look, yeah, was crazy. You look at almost every airplane. I got the retriever atta attached to the tail and ripped it up. Yeah, but you also see a lot of planes will have a little nick on the wings where it goes. And it's, uh, from a safety standpoint, that can crash an airplane. And yeah, luckily, we keep that area clear. It's probably later in the program, but just in general, with Zoom, maybe it's a good time to mention what a Zoom is so people understand. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can go to Zoom now if you want. Yeah, well, I have another one related to what you said, and it relates to the Zoom. I built a, a bubble dancer for Joe Newland a number of years ago, and we were flying in a, at, at least 10 miles an hour in wind. And uh, he liked to launch hard. He was very competitive, for those of you who knew him. He hit that thing full pedal all the way up, the wings were, tips were practically touching. <laughs> and then on top of that, he took a deep dive and snapped it up on the zoom. He wanted everything out of that airplane. And he got it. The elevator proceeded to snap in two. So, okay, what do you do? Well, again, it's the same story. He managed to get it inverted, full spoilers, and it floated down just perfectly. So it works with RES airplanes too. Yeah, and full flaps is probably, I've had, I've seen it, I've had it happen just recently. What happens is you've got the toe line, you've got the retriever line going up with the airplane. And when you come off the zoom, you typically dip the nose to gain, to take the advantage of all the stretch that's built up in the line. And then you come up sharply. Well, if you go too deep, you can do a couple of things. You can get tied up to the retriever line, or you can get tied up to the winch line. Not too long ago, I had two antennas sticking out. <laughs> you guys remember it, it was just a couple of months ago. Um, most, most of you were there. Uh, and I got a little deep, and this is uh, what I think happened, because I didn't, couldn't tell for sure. And it wrapped around the nose, and proceeded to remove both antennas. And uh, that was the last control I had of it. And uh, the next thing I know, I was doing, using both hands to try to pull it out of the ground. So you can have a lot of bad things happen on, on launching. Okay, maybe with one last thing on safety. So what, what sorts of things do you do before you fly? What kind of checks do you do? Uh, the, uh, the person that's operating the retriever has the largest safety responsibility at launch time. And that involves really just thinking about the whole thing, starting with the pilot. You look at the pilot, you make sure that they're checking their control surface, they're moving. You look at the retriever line, you make sure that it's not choked up. In other words, it's not close to the plane, but it's three feet away from the plane, because the retriever line's on a slider and it slides back and forth on the leader, a three-foot leader that connects to the plane. You want to make sure that's all the way out. And then you have to look down at the ground and make sure that that retriever line is not wrapped around a toolbox or a hammer or a stake or anything. Or the arm. That yeah, the arm, and you have to make sure the arm is down. Uh, so if you, if you understand the function of all the equipment, because the pilot's got his hands full. He's fighting the wind. He's trying to keep the plane level. He's thinking about his flight. Um, so at least if there's another person there, then that person becomes fully responsible for safety. And you do a lot of pre-flight stuff as you're assembling your airplane. You just want to make sure everything, and, it, and it get, you just keep looking at it. And if it doesn't look right, it's probably not right. So, and each time before you throw the airplane, step on the pedal and throw the airplane, make sure that you got some surfaces wiggly, perfectly all of them. That's one advantage of having having a drug dropping trailing edge. You can see four of those surfaces working uh, sometimes. I, I, yeah, I've learned to wiggle every time. Yeah, every time. Every time. And, but the other thing I'm starting to do now is when I first set up the plane, I always go turn right, turn left, turn yeah. up, turn down. Yeah. Just look at it, all the flaps. Every surface. Yeah, all the surfaces. Let me add one more thing to that. Is I learned I wiggle surfaces. I found uh, I did that just routinely thinking. With your hand. Yeah. yeah. And the my rudder look at a couple of the uh, uh, servo screws. Where we was and had a lot of slop. So you, so you wiggled the rudder. Yeah, I wiggle rudder elevator. And, you know, when I'm setting up, I wiggle everything yeah. um, because you can get slop. Or uh, typically in an Explorer, they have little um, 
it's a slot above where you pin it in. If you accidentally put it in that slot, it looks like it's working, but it's not. You know, it's sort of working. Yeah. So I just get in the habit of doing that. And it, I've caught a couple of things. One is the Explorer not being in the right slot, and the elevator servo. The screws were just, you know, they worked out, but they looked like they were okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another thing I do before that'll I first play. play. Yeah. Huh? So I think that'll cost you a plane to get yeah. that. <laughs> you can lose just about any service but the elevator. Yeah. Okay. I'm still getting plane down. Yeah. Okay, so we go on to launch modes. Um, anyone want to explain that? Maybe you could show your plane. And I'd slide. love to show <laughs> the surfaces for you, but... Uh, Maybe you could just point to them and describe Okay, it. if you look at the flight surfaces, you'll see that all but one of them is in an pro approximately proper launch position. <laughs> you will move the other one. Go ahead, go ahead. The other aileron, the bottom one should be. Straddle of cables. Yeah. Straddle Close enough. Cables. You want me to bring the plane over? Probably. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll point to it. Uh, okay, you want to put it across the tables? If you can do that, we can set the tail up. If you want to set it here with the tail here, I'll... Uh, uh, oh! <laughs> <Hello. Anyway. laughs> Over here. Things are bigger than you think. I'm going to say what I'm doing. Oh, that's great. Hold on. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so I thought, yeah, if you just grab one. Put the leading edge down and I'll just hold it. Yeah, yeah, let's let it out of it. So just kind of describe yeah. what a launch mode looks like. You so don't have to move surfaces. No, it, what, you, what you see is a, a drooping trailing edge. It adds camber, gives you better lift. So keep that way. Camber is camber is the, the curvature of the the trailing edge. Curve is facing down yeah. on the underside. Yeah. Of the thing, right? I mean, there's some airplanes have to build in camber right. of, of some degree. Most air, a lot of airplanes do. Underside. Uh, but you can change the camera with with the trailing edge camera, uh, and that's for your different flight modes. So this is an approximate approximates a, a launch mode, um, and it's like a lot of lift because they're all kind of yes. And at the very top with the apogee of your launch, just as you dip the nose down, you take the camera up to get maximum speed and and uh, for your zoom, which is a, the, the flight after you come off the hook. So you'll get another, pick a number, uh, 100 feet after you come off the hook. Reach the 399 and then .9. That's right, 30, 399 feet, that's our FAA limit. <laughs> uh, but there are other modes, you've got uh, uh, launch, uh, zoom, um, re reflex, and thermal. So. Do you want to mention how you change that from one to another? It's not it's all on switches. In, in mine, it's all. I have two switches to operate all four of those. The other, the other change that you have, the camera changing one, is the flaps, and that's on the stick. And so you can control the the flaps at landing and reduce, uh, you increase the drag. And uh, some the controversial thing that I found, but recently, because I've always used a lot of crow, and this is what crow looks like. you got a flap here down, and an aileron that is up. And some folks think that's not a good thing. And so I've actually backed off with some of the people I respect on, and uh, Rich Spicer, we've had several conversations, heated conversations about it, and I've been stubborn enough, I've, keep, I've kept the, the uh, crow in, uh, and I'm kind of working my way out of that to see if I, my landings are any better because they aren't that. Because they want to think the, the, the flaps tend to, to stall the tip yeah. of the wing. Well, yeah, that, that's the secondary. Uh, the flaps slow you down. Uh, that's all they do is add. Once you get below about 20 degrees or so, it's only drag. And so when we go to close to 90, uh, these things almost stop. The, um, the crow is more how fast it sinks down. So it's actually speeding it up. It's acting like a spoiler. It's acting like it, a spoiler. Exactly, and it, but it doesn't spoil, but it, it you know, pushes it, it, yeah, push it down. The other advantage is, a, uh, and I use about, and most most people I know use about an eight inch max for stall and the sinking, just so you're not, you know, when you're ready to do the pushover, uh, you're pretty slow, typically, and you just don't want to be unstable. 
Well, I got thinking about it, and I don't know how the term came up, but adding crow to it may actually act like wish out, if I got that right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you're flying really slow, uh, when we have these flaps deployed that far, we're, we hope to be flying really slow because we're, gonna, we're landing. And I don't think that washout is is of any it has any positive effect on you at those low air speeds because you're not trying to regain flight. You're not going to try to come out and fly again. You're you're going to land. And so anyway, I, I'm but, still but, 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 my jury's still out. But uh, because the wing tips are narrower than the rest of the wing, having some washout in there is going to uh, put off the tip stall when you're getting really, really slow. Maybe if you get really slow close to the ground, that's tip true. stall. This you're is in more real trouble. Yeah. Yeah, but it only means maybe a couple of millimeters. Yeah, and again, that, that's that's what I'm trying to parallelize, if that's a word. The, the, the difference, the reason with a crow versus a tip stall. And wash out. So I'm I'm doing some some uh, playing around at this point. One thing I should have added is there's a, a, a final mode which is called Kapow. That was actually invented by Bob McGowan and one of the teams like 10 years ago, international team. They purposely kept it secret. What happens is when you are in full flap mode or flaps, you're in landing mode. The flaps are down. Um, when you get above 90, I set mine about 98 percent on elevator down. The ailerons and flap to go up as high as they physically can, and the elevator goes down as far as it physically can. Because you're doing it, you're only going ground speed maybe three miles an hour, and it basically arcs you into the spot. And that's called kapow mode. And as soon as you let up, you know, as you're doing the flap up, then it then it quits. But that's a really important. If you ever see these guys coming in, they're coming in slow, and all of a sudden they just arc into the spot, that's normally the power mode. Because we're going so slow, the elevator is not that effective. There is, there is one thing notably different though, is that the skill set of a Bob McGowan coming in, they're not only slow, but they're very low. Because Bob will come in, yeah. low ground effect. It's very hard for a novice to learn a skill set to maintain enough energy in the airframe, to keep flying, and yet be six inches in elevation. But somehow he does that. He's coming in at about you know, six to eight inches in elevation, which also gives your eyesight a better view of the landing tape. Because if it's, if it's one thing you get your depth perception, but your depth perception effect is really minimized if you're only six inches above the ground. You know where it's going to hit. And when you hit Kapow at the nail, at, the, at the, the post that holds the tape into the ground, from six inches up, you're not really going to wreck much. You're already, you're already so low. Um, I don't have the skills to properly use that technique, and I would imagine that more carnage would, would happen than not. But uh, I've watched Bob do it a number of times. And, and most of us come in a lot higher than that. Yeah. And uh, I know I do, and it's trying to maintain the energy to reach the, yeah. the spot. So when we, when we, when we just hit, we just hit down. Usually. Yeah, and, right. And, and it's all a matter of timing, but it's also a matter of perspective. Your, your, depth, your depth perception is really important. Depth. But I know one of the things you're going to bring up is uh, flaps need to be up when you do land. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> there you go. And they do need to be up because they can't, they will get damaged by hitting the ground and they'll take that's, out the surface. That's somewhat aircraft dependent, right? So it it is. All, that's, that's correct. The, the, uh, this one barely touches. The but ability I of the flap to touch the ground is aircraft dependent. But the kinetic energy of the flap acting against the hinge is not aircraft dependent. It can right. be can be six inches above the ground, but you've still got all that oh, okay. that's not in line with the hinge. So you can and so you're going to you're so. load your linkage in your servo up yeah. if they're not. And, it, and it'll go forward in that case. It's not just yeah. it's damaged it's, by the drag of the ground. It's, a, that's it's good damaged good. by the momentum of the Correct. aileron. Good right. the flap. So are you still on launch modes? No, I think, <laughs> on, I think we're getting to the tap. Are you still on the tap or not to tap? You've been getting the flaps up. I am. I would yeah. train myself. Quick, quick, quick side note on the flap thing is I find a cheap four-house phone is invaluable. 
Uh, to learn how to do that, I probably put four or five hundred flights in the phonies, and they just scrape the foam and, and to make it muscle memory. Yeah. And yeah. It, uh, it took a long time because uh, you know, I'm relatively still new to, to gliders, and uh, uh, but that was the cheapest way I did it. So I have some foams at home with a bunch of uh, asphalt scrapes on the flat. I actually put some new tape on my, my flap thing, so when, when I'm landing, I click the blue tape, and I realize it's In fact, one advantage of the PAL mode is it, it does that initial, as soon as you get the full down, the flaps are above center, yeah. and then you know, it's not as critical time. Yeah. So, uh, Bob, I thought I'd uh, talk about uh, tapping or not tapping. You seem to know, have a sense of that. Well, it depends on the, the strength of your airplane. If you've got uh, a plane that is, you're a little worried, and I tend to be conservative when it comes, because I built a thing that, you know, I, I fly bubble dancers and I don't want to uh, overly stress them. It's, it's not just about money on that. It's about a lot of sweat. <laughs> Yeah. So I have respect for the airplane. But uh, so like what does tapping do? Tapping, what, what, the way I launch is I give it full pedal until I feel the plane leaving my hand. I don't really have to throw it unless I'm throwing downwind, if, if it's unfortunate that the wind's blowing uh, in the direction of launch. As soon as it leaves my hand, uh, it'll rotate and go straight up. And then, uh, as soon as I hit maybe 20 feet or so, I start, I start tapping and I keep my eye on the wings. And I watch the bend in the wings. And I push it just hard enough to, to get the desired bend and I don't push it any harder. Then, when I get near the top, then it, at that point, it's safe to hit the full pedal again. Your nose and I push the nose down and then, uh, uh, in a shallow dive and then pull up and release the, the uh, pedal and I'll get, get the, the zoom. Okay, and you mentioned the wind. We kind of skipped over that, but any mm -hmm. comments about wind and high wind, high wind, wind, reverse wind? I have flown in with, with bubble dancers unloaded in 15 mile an hour winds and, and it, I can do that. I can land safely. I don't like to do it. It's not any fun, really. There are no thermals. Usually. It does affect your choice of tapping, though, because when the wind comes yeah. up, you tap on it. You have to tap, and then naturally, uh, the poor guy on the uh, on the retriever may have to actually reel in just a little line once in a while to keep it from blowing back too far. Uh, especially with a with a light res plane, you're going up so slowly that the wind just keep keeps bubbling back. Back and back. Sounds dangerous. You can't do that though because then the arm, once the arm comes down to real, yeah, that's you can't right. tap it. You can't tap it. That's so right. That's why in some cases, in, in contest work especially, a good a good uh, retriever guy will actually reel in just a little bit of line, even if he does it manually, just to keep up with you. Oh, you mean just with turning the wheel with the Yeah, just to keep, the, keep from billowing back too much. Might not be dangerous. That might not be <laughs> safe. How about the wind is blowing in reverse direction? Like tailwind. Change, tailwind. Tailwind. Oh, that's. That's not an issue when it comes to, to that. There, then it's just balls to the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Full, you know, full pedal. And you know, and even with an RS, it's full pedal. I, I, I remember in, in uh, um, Sacramento one time, the wind turned backwards during a contest, and we had probably eight or ten blowing with the wind, and I'm launching an Astrojet, if you can imagine. And that thing went halfway down the field at about uh, 30, 40 feet before it finally had enough speed to gain altitude. But I made my time. <laughs> Go figure. But that's that is it's. But that's dangerous. It's a dangerous position to be for the airplane, for sure. and mostly for the airplane. I mean, you 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 got a certain airspeed you have to achieve, and when the wind's already going that negative airspeed. You want to get an airspeed of 11 and you have an 11 mile an hour wind, that means you got to, that plane's got to be moving at 20 miles an hour and start flying. You got to pull it as hard as you can and and toss it and everything else you can do to get some airspeed right but, away. But that that retrieving line billowing back, I've seen it back billow back and we oh yeah pretty much yell, do not retrieve. Don't retrieve it. Just let it fall down and. and uh, sometimes we yell a couple of times to make sure the retriever doesn't 
do it because that's really uh, can can be painful. Fortunately, we've never had that I know of. I've never seen a big, any kind of a real injury with that. So this that kind of billowing back gets to be especially bad. I would say uh, in in um, case the wind is 10, 12 yeah, or right above. Down. Yeah, that's where it starts. And, and again, that's the safety responsibility of the person operating the retriever to notice that and not retrieve. Yeah. So, Rich, I was going to ask one more thing. Oh. <laughs> when you're the retriever, watch the line and watch. Yeah. Don't worry about the airplane. It's your job to retrieve the line, not help them fly the airplane. Yeah, that's right. Focus on that. So, so Rich, I was going to ask you about pop offs. What causes them and what do you do if you have a pop off? Well, you know, there's a lot of different things that can cause a pop-off. So what is a pop-off? A pop-off is when the plane comes, when the tow hook of the plane comes disconnected from the launch line. A little too early. Anytime before you want it to, technically. Um, but the simplest reason for a pop-off for a lightweight plane is too much line tension. If you had, for example, a light two-meter two -meter plane, and you had any amount of line tension, as soon as you let go of the plane, the line tension will accelerate the plane faster than the line is moving. That's especially true if the, if the plane is a little bit nose heavy and it's really going fast, it's going to naturally tend to want to arc right off and disconnect itself. So uh, the, the solution for that is to not build up any line tension, to basically hold the plane loosely in your hand and it's a lightweight plane you're going to be tapping anyway, mm -hmm. tap the plane out of your hand and you can avoid the line tension. Start tapping off. immediately and, and uh, watch the angle of the ascent and watch the wings. Build, building up line tension is a skill you need to learn. Yeah. So it's pretty. The second, the second most common reason for a pop off, in, in, in my opinion, is trim. If you have an elevator with up trim, that means that the amount of, of nose lifting forces that you have are proportional to the speed. And so as that plane speeds up excessively, if there's any line tension, you put a pitch the nose up and again, you come off the line. Uh, another one is if you're maintaining a new plane and you're not sure where the tow hook is supposed to be. There was a time when convention was that you would draw a vertical line through the center of gravity the one that's shown on the plans for most planes, and then move about 15 degrees forward of that and find the intersection of that with the bottom of the fuse, and you would put the tow somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, generally, one of the reasons for putting the tow hook in front of the CG is to prevent pop-offs. And that's probably a good place to start in, in a lot of cases, but then you'll find as you fine-tune everything, the tow hook will start. Each, each airframe is different. Um, and then the other thing that happens with modern full house molded planes is that the amount of camber that you use when you throw the plane changes the pitch of the plane also. Mm -hmm. And then the angle at which you throw the plane is also different. I, I happen to be one that throws the plane pretty much vertically. And the way I hold the plane, the way I launch the plane, comes out of my hand almost straight up. And the thing to remember about any launch mode where whether you're launching this way or that way, I know you launch horizontally, I like to go vertically, is that the center of gravity of the plane, as it's designed by the aircraft designer and as it's shown on the plans, is irrelevant when you're on the tow hook. The center of gravity is the tow hook when you're under look because the plane will then pivot about that point. And what really matters then is what is pitching it. Is, is the tail pitching it? Is the airfoil camber pitching it? And you don't want it to pitch beyond a degree that will pop it off. So. And so any, any no advice, reasons. once you do pop off and you're low, low to the ground, any, any tricky maneuver? You know, I, I call it scram. <laughs> yeah. Do whatever you got to do to get the wings level and get it back in control. You got to get the nose down, you got to just scram the plane and get it down. It yeah. depends on your airspeed and your altitude. Mm -hmm. If you're at an attitude where you can push the nose over and keep flying, that's ideal. Let's go for it. Yeah. If you're at an attitude where you don't have enough energy to either do a loop or to push the nose over, that's the most dangerous position you can be in because you're more than likely going to land on the tail of the plane 
and the less people are running. All, all you can do is pull full up elevator and pray. And pray, yeah. Full up elevator? Yes. What, what does it do? This? It's, it's, it's going to tail slide and drop down and, and hopefully pull yeah. out support. It's, yeah. Yeah. You don't want a vertical stall, but I, I, what, what it takes to get out of a lot of these uh, pop-off situations, and I've been in a lot of them, unfortunately, <laughs> is a lot of patience because you have to let the plane if it's coming over back, you got to let it finish, finish the loop. and get the airspeed up and to the point where you have control of it again. Try not to make it worse. And try not to make it worse. And, and just fly it up. You know. Okay. And try not to hit somebody. That's, yeah. That points to the fundamental, the old fundamental, when you're learning to fly, one of the first things you have to learn to do is break a stall immediately. If you can do that, then you're home free. Okay, um, I have a list of accidents. That's a kind of scary <laughs> list. Um, do we want to go through that, or should we go out somewhere? There's never an accident. <laughs> We've been pretty lucky to say it really we have. I've only known a couple of I guess on a launch, the most famous accident is the wings break. They're pulled out, at least on a pul balsa plane. That, and, and you know what? The, the, the beauty of that kind of accident is the only thing that got hurt was was the airplane and the yeah, ego of the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> the, most, the most dangerous accident that can happen at our club field is dealing with a line under tension. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll find the line will get jammed at the turnaround. And if, if the retriever has got that line under tension, the stored energy in that line can easily lock one of your fingers off. Yeah. So that is the most dangerous situation that we ever deal with. And it can happen once a month or so that, that we have a turnaround issue. As soon as you yeah. notice that that uh, retriever stall, get your foot off of it. Because you can just keep you build up more and more tension. Yeah. Like a big rubber band. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the line tension is in the retriever. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to make sure you test the line or drop the arm before you get your fingers near it. That's Absolutely. Just keep your fingers away from line that's under tension, yeah. because it's the last thing you want to do is have your fingers up. There's one thing worth, worth mentioning about retrievers is that the hardest thing we teach new people that's never used a retriever before is don't tap it. I mean, under normal conditions, you don't tap the retriever, you step on it, you hold it until the line is on the ground, because as soon as you start doing, if the arm doesn't come up all the way while you're tapping it, then it gets all tangled up. And, uh, there is one other thing we pay attention to, as we talked about in the discussion about zooming. If you're operating the retriever and the person has a foul up in the line during the zoom, you really need to pay attention to that because you can draw the plane in half yourself by retrieving when the retriever line or the winch line, whenever they're connected together, are wrapped around any part of the airframe. So you really have to keep an eagle eye. It's not easy. That's one of the reasons I recommend every pilot say the word off. Yeah. 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 Line I'm not very As a retriever, sometimes if it's foggy and yeah. the sun's the right angle, I can't tell when it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Vision's, vision's better than others, too. It's I good to yell launching, too, which we sometimes forget to do. Yeah. Yeah. Any time launching, anyone flying yeah. in the area yeah. would know. Yeah. 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 There, there's a, to me, there's a kind of a logical way of, of setting up, going through getting an airplane set up to fly. And um, it all it relates to all of these things, uh, especially launching and flying. Um, Bob McGowan and I don't have I don't have that much experience in full house, but he told me that the thing that he always does is make sure that in all of his modes, in launch mode, in cruise mode, in thermal mode, whatever modes he has set up in the airplane. He has it set up such that uh, when the airplane's in the air in any one of these modes, it will fly straight and level. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stall. It doesn't dive. It's a good test. And uh, and the other thing is with either either with flaps or with spoilers, the nature of the uh, inner of the uh, compensation <laughs> is nonlinear, and uh, so you have to have. I use a three point, I find three points is enough. You may want to have more than three points in the curve that relates the two. But decide whether you want it to fly straight and level with 
spoilers or flaps, or you want it to have a slightly down path, downward path, it should follow that path no matter where that control surface is. Or for anyone attempted to fly before they figure out the programming for flaps or spoilers, be aware that spoilers can deploy to push the nose down, flaps tend when deployed to pull the nose Exactly out. right. So you have to compensate in the opposite direction of that. So and get them mixed up. Talk about camper changing. Um, I was thinking about getting on the land landing. That okay. Sure. You know. So, so um, who wants to introduce landing and what's yeah, maybe the approach? Everyone does it differently. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Bob McGowan at uh, Davis a couple months ago put on a, uh, uh, I can't believe last fall, put on a, a demonstration play of what he does. And the, the real takeaway I have on that, the landing, is he wants it, no matter what the wind is, he wants to come in at the same ground speed, which looks like about a fast walk, you know, five miles an hour. So, yeah. Yeah. And so he balances, or excuse me, ballasts his airplanes roughly so they can land at the same ground speed regardless of the wind. And he's flying up, it's pretty, you know, we, you know, in the contest we all fight in over 20 mile an hour wind sometimes. Mm -hmm. And to me that was sort of an eye opener on at least ballasting for landing. Now there's also, he'll vary from that on his, because his main thing is he wants to get home on it. But it, it, he says it basically works out about the same. And like we were talking earlier, most and I strive for this, but rarely do it, where you, you're, here's the post, and you want to have, you're in basically ground effect, and you want to make it so you have a planned arc into it, and again, having the flaps and elevator compensation, no matter what you're at, and it tends to be a, a half of a bell curve, mm -hmm. um, they're, the, you're not fussing with the ailerons. And I've seen so many people set up airplanes, I've helped people set up airplanes where yeah, full flaps and no flaps are perfect, but in between, they're fighting the elevator. And you just, I can't think of two things at once that easily. So yeah. that's just one, you're trying to minimize workload. Uh, you know, same thing with differential and rudder correction and all that stuff. The whole point is, so you're just focusing on hitting the spot and not worrying about the plane ballooning on you. Yeah, like typically one, one guys one hit flaps and it balloons. I put a little, I slow my flaps down just a little bit, half second, so the, the elevator uh, has time to respond to the flaps moving. The first inch of flap movement, it takes, in servo speed, that's nothing, but the elevator takes a longer time to compensate, both aerodynamically and speed-wise. Or I actually slow down the flaps a little bit, or some guys that are more dexterous will slow their stick down. Mm -hmm. uh, or should you guys? Yeah. Yeah. The big part of landing is is setting up for making a planning and planning a flight, having a flight a plan for landing, making a downwind leg, crosswind leg, or the final leg. And it's different for each pilot, each airplane, each plane type, and all the settings are all variable. So you know, at what time do you start? What altitude do you want to be at? Yeah. Uh, when you start your you know your downwind leg. Uh, those are all variable. And, it's uh, good to have that conversation with whoever's timing because you don't know who's going to be timing you. And to have the call outs and the intervals that you like to hear. For right. example, if you like to have your downwind called out at, at 30 seconds and then your crosswind start at 20, you want to have the increments enough that you can, that you can work that into your flight plan. Although the way I like to do it is just every second at 30 and I try to start parallel to my if I'm looking at the spot, the plane crosses at 30 and then take it down and then I compensate for wind as to how many seconds I go before I start my turn and leaving how many seconds to come back. If I like. Yeah, there's a couple of schools of thought on that. I, I use 20 seconds mm -hmm. is my thing, a little faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I know Bob McGowan uses something around 15 or 10. For the whole thing? Yeah. I mean, he his landing approach his downwind is maybe 30 feet, and just to the cone and, and back. Well, that's, that's interesting because actually, if you think about it, the shorter time you can make it, the less error you probably have to that's, the that's the theory. I, yeah. My brain doesn't work that fast. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't like to work that fast. But your plane is slower also. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But the, the big thing is consistency. You know, like 
I always practice 20 seconds. I, I fly to my house with a foamy, I do the same thing, it's 20 seconds. So when you say 20 seconds, you mean it's even with you? Yeah, even with me. Uh, perpendicular and, to the wind. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting is if I'm at 28 seconds, I screw up, then I know how to compensate at least. Mm -hmm. Because now I just have a, a variable. Or if I'm at 18 seconds, I know, okay, hurry up. Sure. At least you have a frame of mind regarding what you do all the time. If you screw up a little bit, you just know, okay, speed it up or slow it down. Sure, that's 25, then you break it into 12 and 12 or something. The yeah. seconds don't change depending on wind. I mean, you always um, have the same number of seconds. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. Like, like you said, I'll, I'll vary with the wind. Uh, usually I'm ballasted up in wind, so it's not a huge difference. But if I get, if I get, um, you know, wind picks up in a flight, um, I'll, I'll make it much, I actually make it tighter because like 15 seconds. it has caught me a couple of times. Uh, like when I, I fly uh, F, you know, a, uh, FAI events where your window ends your flight, you, you have to be, um, you know, it's, it's really important to have that timing because you would at zero landing. You, you go know, over. Yeah. You can make it. Well, I was curious if you take a little more time, 30 seconds, and we do. Is that your plane slower or your brain slower? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of experience. <laughs> I have a lot of experience with not making my time, <laughs> and really that can change your attitude towards your landing points. Sometimes, if you're not, if you know you're not going to make the time, or you're just too low to make this full 30 second, 15 second plan, scratch the plan. What works for me at that point in time is because I'm just, I'm just not that good at this stuff. Really, when you get down to it is to come in with as much energy as possible. If I'm really short on time, I can much better throttle my way to, this, to the 100 point marker than I can float my way to the 100 point marker. That's what I do with, with RES especially, because with it, with the Bubble Dancer and planes like it, with the thin wings, you can actually pick up some pretty good speed if you push them down elevated. So you can compensate for being a little bit late by diving, by being a little high, which I usually try to do, a little high, and especially if there's a little wind, dive to the spot, and then 20 feet away, pop the spoiler and it'll immediately slow down, and you can just float to the spot. I've made many flights in contests whereby I thought, I just need to make one more turn, and I'll get my time. <laughs> and then you run out. And I get zero landing. Yes. <laughs> Walk of shame. And that's not a good thing. Don't try to get greedy and try to save the time. Get the landing points. They're more valuable at that time. Figure close out. to the time. That's possible over a minute and a half worth of points on the landing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so be greedy about your landing points. Don't be greedy about your landing points. Yeah, do be greedy about landing Don't be so, greedy about your time. Oh, don't. Okay. Yeah, well, right. It's better said than done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's We've hard, all done. hard to have that feeling when your timer is not even close But you to think I'm going to find that 20 foot thermal that's good. I've seen you do it. Kick it up there. No, well, you've seen me do it. I've seen you do it twice. I've seen you do it. I've seen you do it. Get a new ground effect. There are those of you who can think about time and and the spot both at the same time. In my case, a lot of times what I'll do is when I get within about five seconds, I ignore the time and just focus on the spot. Get the points that more valuable. And in most times you're gonna get I, I get within a second or two. I've time for a lot of people that say don't count the last five seconds. Mm -hmm. For that reason, you tell me, you know, and I can understand it because yeah. You know, what happens? Well, you're, you're not gonna do you're not gonna change the course of history. Well, Except for an FAI event. Yes, then it's really important. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to get over it. But yeah, I, they just are focusing yeah. Yeah. on the landing. Because what's a second here or there yeah, compared to the points? One launch we haven't mentioned, I don't know if we want to, is Aerotow. Um, if you want, yeah, we were about to finish up, so go ahead and oh. say something about it. Um, just a few words on it. Aerotow launching is a little bit different. Uh, usually these planes are, are full house and what you do, at least what the conventional wisdom is and it's what I do, turn the rudder off, leave it just in neutral and during the launch I use the flaps or the elevator uh, 
to slow the plane down as needed if you tend to want to overtake the tow plane at all. Um, you can give it a little bit of uh, up, up elevator and that'll slow the plane down. It won't stall because you're being pulled. Mm -hmm. And when, when the tow plane starts to make a gentle turn to come back and to, to pull you around, the tendency might be to bank the plane with the ailerons. Don't do that. Keep the wings level. Just keep level and just let the tow plane pull you around. It'll yaw you around. Yeah. Well, you don't even need rudder. You do. No, it's no rudder. Just use the ailerons to keep the plane as level as possible. <clears throat> and if, if, if you see any slackening in the line, any glitch, <laughs> anything like that going on, hit the release. Get off of there. Because only bad things happen if you snap the line. Okay. Great. Flying, flying surfaces, one quick, just one quick comment. There's six flight conditions. Each one has a little different surface area. First you have launch, then you have, uh, you try to zoom to maximize your zoom. And uh, you have a thermal mode when you're in a thermal. And you have a reflex when you want to, when you're too far out, you want to get back quickly. So and reflex is like a speed mode. It's a speed mode. It's 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 runs up right. Up and the and it uh, flies faster. So <coughs> you can make more territory with a given altitude. That's, mm -hmm. And then, of course, flaps for landing. And then you have cruise for your normal flight. I just wanted to mention that. They're all different. Almost well, every airplane tells you the setting. Like I have one where speed mode is level, no off. I have others like the Explorer, like yeah. Shoot Mill Mirrors. And, yeah. uh, and cruise and launch, they're all. That's, I can always say it's better instructions than these plans, but at least that's one thing they usually tell you uh, yeah. as a starting point. Yeah. Wow, that's a great this is a very cool thing. It's a template, and I've seen them one template for the, for the flap, and then you just match the surface out here. But this particular one has a template, this is courtesy of Mr. Duder there. This one uh, matches the um, flying surface. So there's a, this has a cruise mode on it, and it has uh, degrees marked on here, so you can check, change it for your different flight modes. Um, the other one that I saw actually had the flight modes marked on it. This one has it in degrees, but it's very cool. You can also get them online, made out and make one out of paper, which yeah, that's what I did. which you did. Okay. But anyway, it's very cool for setting your airplane up. And I, unfortunately, I've used the thing too many times already. Uh, and you get to use it again, I guess. And then we'll use it again. That's the problem I got. Okay, so uh, any questions for the audience before we wrap up? Uh, I, have, I have one question, and it's back to operating a retriever. <coughs> uh, Two contests ago, I was flying my Sagita and the wind was starting to come up. So I was actually going up the tow line fairly slowly because I was, you know, Bob says reading the bend and the wings and all that. And I think Rich Spicer was operating the retriever. He says, you're going to have to get off pretty soon. I said, why? And he says, well, take a look at the retriever line and it was starting to blow way back. What are your feelings about the guy operating the retriever just going in, stepping on the pedal, and taking up that yeah, slack? Okay, so. It can be dangerous if he pulls in too much. That's so you're you're dangerous to the plane, and, no, and if you, at that point, you know what the plane's going to do either. It is his job to talk to you, though. In well, the worst case, though, wouldn't it just pull the tow hook off of the, no. the tow line off of his tow hook? No. Not what it's going to do is pull your plane down a little bit, Yeah. and you okay. might pop off. As a, as you probably would pop off. As a result, if he does nothing, no one gets hurt. The easiest thing is put a little bit in the elevator. Like I'll squeeze a little bit of down, speed up a little bit, pull the line. Pull. I do it for two reasons. One is it'll hit the brim of your hat. I mean, it's hard to see when it's going that angle. Mm -hmm. But the other one is the line. If you watch it, will come back. So I just squeeze a little in until you're out, like you know. 50, 80 meters, and then go back. That was, and that'll just take up some of that slack that's blown into the yeah. retriever yeah. line. And you can see it better, too. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. pull it forward. But again, <laughs> again the, 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 the retriever operator is the most critical there. Do no harm. And I keep the camber for launch the same regardless of when. 
So with that line that, that billows, it can get wrapped around other planes and bit oh, other yeah, people yeah. in the pit. Yeah. Yeah, the best thing is just don't do anything. So if it's it out, bad. just don't retreat. But, right. but again, it's just his job to tell you. Back and just and it. manually clean it up. It's, it's, it's his job to tell you. I can't retreat. Okay. At that point, it's all up to you. So you go do your zoom and situational he awareness. cleans it up so. after. <laughs> it, 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 it's all about safety. Situational awareness for the retriever operator. Uh, okay. A lot more than it would seem. Let me. Oh, Walter, do you ever use carrier aircraft? Carrier aircraft, the uh, hard mounts to one aircraft drops the aircraft. Oh no, mm -hmm. no, it's something we haven't done. It'd be cool. I thought about it. Yeah. Um, but I don't. It's these airplanes are. They're too hard to build and they're too expensive mm -hmm. to to try an unknown. Method, although that sounds like sounds like gun, but I would do it with foamies. Yeah. yeah, do it with foamies. Yeah. You can do it with foamies, sure. Okay. Okay, and Gary, do you have any questions on on the webinar, webinar side? Is he there, Gary? Okay. No more questions. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.